And I thank you to Professor Jonas Anderson, Associate Professor at the Department of Built Environment and Environmental Science of Malmo University, Sweden. Uh, I'm very glad uh, that he can uh, give uh, us a lecture uh, about uh, accessible architecture and all the perspective on user requirements. This is a very specific topic, very important. Uh, we never talked about this point, so it's uh, our, for you maybe it's the first contact with this matter that is absolutely relevant for social reasons, of course, and uh, for uh, the technical um, challenge that these uh, problems of accessibility put in the architectural design. So thank you, Jonas. Uh, I give you the, 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 the microphone for your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity to uh, further enter into the, the topic of accessible architecture. And uh, I would like to start with some words about our universities, because that would give a backdrop to the subject. Uh, I'm not uh, actually speaking from Malmö University, since we are supposed to work from home. But this is the main building at the new campus of Malmö University in the Western Harbour in the city. And it's a quite new university founded in 1998. And in comparison with uh, the Polimi, I think that's the correct abbreviation for Politecnico di Milano, that you were founded in 1863, I think. And uh, I think you are Mila the largest university in Milan as well. We have about uh, 24,000 students and uh, 200 PhD candidates and about 1,400 employees. And uh, as you can see, we are located in the dockyard area, uh, so we can actually see Copenhagen in, in a far distance. And the Malmö University is, of course, part of this region that is called the Sound region, or Öresundsregionen in, the Nor in a Nordic tongue. And uh, this focus on uh, education and uh, it's part of uh, of uh, this tradition of uniting the Nordic countries in, in uh, mutual collaborations. <clears throat> so in the Öresund region, we have several universities, like the Lund University in, in Sweden, formed, founded in 1666, and the Copenhagen University, founded in 1479. And this is only to give you a backdrop of to the question of uh, accessibility, because seen in an architecture perspective, accessibility is a quite a recent phenomenon. And I will develop this further in, in during the lecture. So this will be, I think, I put it in the corner, a lecture on accessible architecture a Nordic perspective on user requirements. And the overview of the lecture is that you will have an introduction to the subject. We will also uh, introduce standards and minimum requirements about accessibility. We will also look into concepts, definitions, and prevalence of uh, the word accessibility and usability. And we will also enter into the matter concretely by focusing on 10 different aspects of accessibility. And finally, we will arrive at some conclusions. And I estimate that this lecture will be about two hours. And I would suggest that we have a break for 15 minutes within an hour. So about half past. Um, Three, we can have a 15 minute uh, pause, or as we call it in the Nordic tongue, a leg stretch. I don't know whether you use it in Italian, but a leg stretch. Uh, yes, it's fine, Jonas. Yes, we, we can uh, make this break in the middle of the lecture, it's fine. Great. 
Uh, I would like to start with this announcement that the European Committee for Standardization, uh, the CEN, that, that is the abbreviation for the European Standardization Organization, that they proclaimed in on uh, 30th October this year that we have really good news today. The FPREN 17210 on accessibility and usability of the built environment has been approved by 93.75% of the member states. And uh, 50 national members have approved the document, one has rejected it, and 13 have abstained from uh, answering the question. And uh, this is actually quite a step forward and also a logical step in the development of accessibility for the use uh, for the built environment. Uh, the European Union has, uh, since 2010, tried to develop minimum requirements uh, for the built environment and transportation for the European countries. And uh, in order to, and that was a consequence of uh, the European Union signing a UN convention that we will look into shortly. Uh, but uh, this standardization project started as a consequence of this signature of the UN Convention called UNCRPD, the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And uh, the European Union is preparing a, a new legal act on accessibility that will apply to all member states. And in consequence that we have different legislations around Europe and all the countries have different levels of accessibility already, uh, there was a need to start working together and concluding a minimum, a document with minimum requirements for accessibility in the use in the built environment. So this standard, which was called FTR, that is a abbreviation for, for, for emphasizing that the standard is still preliminary, is that we have defined a set of minimum requirements for how to execute different building elements in the architectural design and, and conception. And some of you that participate today, you are joining us from outside Europe, and I think from Canada at least, I saw that, and from Asia. Uh, probably you will have uh, a standard called ISO 21542, Accessibility and Usability of the Built Environment. Uh, that's an older uh, standard on accessibility that was introduced in 2006, uh, but it has, a, it, it has been a great uh, uh, model for the European standard and uh, it's about the same topic that is de dealt with in the both standards, although the European standard has been quite substantially more detailed and with the further details on how to arrive at accessibility and usability. When discussing accessible architecture, uh, one might meet architects who think that accessible architecture will be an aesthetical functional dilemma that you can't create aesthetical architecture with accessibility uh, in, in your mind. Uh, but I would say that to my mind accessible architecture is actually quite in line with the classical tradition of uh, uh, architecture and re is referring to the Vitruvian concepts of beauty, sustainability, and uh, usability. So for me, access accessible architecture is a matter of appropriate architectural design to actually find a balance or strike a balance between user needs and aesthetical functional uh, consequences. Uh, Starting off with some definitions, uh, 
architecture is often seen as the art and study of designing buildings, or secondly, the design or style of a building or buildings. At least that's the entry on architecture that you, that you find in the Oxford Advanced American Dictionary. And also you can find, if you look in a etymological uh, dictionary that architecture actually comes from ancient Greek uh, and uh, pointing out the chief builder at the building site, the one who knows the most about building and uh, appropriate building. So I think that's an important uh, um, uh, conclusion to, to have in your mind that architects or, and the, the architect is actually supposed to know the most about building and the user when it comes to defining architecture. In this presentation, I will try to use as many as possible of the Swedish architects as, uh, as topics for, for analysis of various aspects of, of architecture. And if you work in the southern part of Sweden, in Malmö, for instance, you will come across quite often different uh, buildings designed by the Swedish architect Sigurd Leverens, who is perhaps most known for his collaboration with Gunnar Asplund in the Stockholm Forest Cemetery uh, from the early 20th century about, uh, I think it was, the competition was in 1916 or in 19, yes, 1916, I think it was. Uh, and for some reason, Sigurd Leverance also the year after he won that competition with Asplund also won another competition about a cemetery here in Malmö. And uh, he has designed quite a lot of the official buildings here in Malmö. But let's return to the topic. We talked about what the meaning of architecture was, and we can now focus on the meaning of accessibility. And Using Oxford Advanced American Dictionary, you can find these definitions that accessibility is how easy something is to reach, enter, use, see, etc. It could also mean how easy something is to reach, enter, use, etc. for somebody with a disability. And disability is often perceived as being a physical or mental condition, <clears throat> that means you cannot use a part of your body completely or easily. A physical mental disability with people, for instance, with people with severe learning disabilities, or the state of not being able to use a part of your body completely or easily. The state of not being able to learn easily. I think that was a repetition. Sorry about that, Miss misuse of, of uh, copy and paste. Uh, but on the other hand, you could say that the word accessibility, regardless of your national tongue, you will find that this is a word that is entering into the public discussion <clears throat> around the 1960s. And it's also related to what has happened previously during the 20th century. Uh, it was already introduced in the United Kingdom uh, shortly after the First uh, World War I in, in, during the 1920s. But after the Second World War, um, war damages and, and war uh, casualties and, and wounds was spread also to the civilians. So quite a lot of a substantial number of people uh, suffered from different disabilities due to the Second World War. And uh, uh, depending on that fact uh, that people with disabilities actually could not be seen as a small group in society, the political dis discussion in most countries turned into creating um, conditions for the 
for people with disabilities to participate on uh, equal terms in the surrounding society. So if we only use the Swedish example, uh, Sweden was not so involved in the Second World War. Uh, so, but we all we had a, quite a lot, a large group of people uh, suffering from work-related um, injuries, and this group entered into the focus of the discussion during the 1960s. And as a consequence, we introduced the concept of accessibility in the in, in architecture and the built environment. And that has been a, a, a concept that, that has uh, developed since ever since 1974, when it was really introduced in the Swedish building code and applicable both in residential architecture and public architecture. So one conclusion is that you will probably find the word accessibility in national and international policies and programs on the rights for people with disabilities. You can also find it as a concept in legislation that refers to architecture and the built environment. And you can also find uh, accessibility in legislation that concerns the discrimination and, and uh, uh, discrimination legislation. Depending on your legal structure of your country, uh, either the discrimination law is uh, more emphasized and, and has a higher influence on, on the legal structure, so that this act was introduced before the change, but before the act uh, of the built, the act for the built environment in Sweden. We actually introduced the concept, concept firstly in the Building Act, and then actually just in the beginning of the new millennium, we have introduced for accessibility as a ground for discrimination in the Swedish discrimination law. And you will probably also find accessibility in combination with the word, with the word usability, uh, because Accessibility and usability are the key words to designate the group of uh, people with disabilities. And this can also be connected with the fact that we have a United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities that was introduced in 2006. Uh, and you can see that it was ratified in, in Sweden in 2008, in Italy in 2009, as, which was the same year as for the German introduction, in France 2010, and in the UK in 2009. However, it's, it, this convention is still to be ratified in the United States, which is an interesting uh, uh, exception. From the rule. Uh, now we have had uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, what could you say? Uh, label it as uh, disability policy or policy making uh, discussions. And I will give you actually one more aspect of the policy making that will affect architectural design. Uh, because if you take this uh, as a whole, the whole uh, discussion about accessibility in the built environment and in architecture, you can find at least three key concepts that are used for designating appropriate design for people with disabilities. And in the European context, you will probably find design for all as uh, major concept for, for emphasizing accessibility and usability for people with disabilities in, in, uh, in architecture and the built environment. Uh, design for all is at least used mainly by the central European states, uh, as, well in, as well as in the Nordic states. Uh, however, in German speaking countries, you can also uh, come across the 
the barrier free design, which is a type of design that has the same intention as design for all to remove barriers for people with disabilities. In the United Kingdom, you will find these concepts uh, interpreted as inclusive in design because uh, equal access is the key concept in the UK to create equal access to the build to buildings and the built environment. Uh, in contrast, you will find the concept universal design uh, in the US, and you will also find the use of universal design in this UN Convention on the rights of, of for people with disabilities. And that is actually a concept that was coined by an American architect, Ronald L. Mays, who worked uh, quite a, a lot with uh, design problems relating to appropriate architectural design for people with disabilities. And one of uh, and universal design has uh, actually seven principles uh, that is uh, included in the design concept that appropriate design then, universal design is actually something that is uh, indicating equit equitable use, that everyone can use the design. It's a design that has tolerance for error. So it's allowed to, to do some errors before you understand how you do it, actually, how you use the design. It also is a design that can uh, promote flexibility so that you can use the same design object with your left or with your right hand. It is also a design that is um, requiring a very low physical effort that you don't have to press the door handle with the with with your uh, with with your uh, most of your strength. You can apply quite a small portion of of um, strength to open a door. Uh, it's also about intuitivity and and uh, understanding how to use the design. It's also about perceptible information that you can get, that you understand how to get information about how to use the design, a manual or a, a call button so that you can call someone to help you uh, to use the design. And it's also the seventh principle that size and space uh, will allow different users to use the design. And these seven principles are more or less integrated in the understanding of universal design that is uh, coined or explained in Article 9 in the UNCRPD. Uh, so if you have any questions about accessibility and usability, we can take them now uh, before continuing on explaining how accessibility applies to architectural design. So if you have any direct spontaneous question, uh, please ask it ask them now. Eventually you can also write in the chat of course. I'm reading the chat. Yep. But you don't find any questions? No. Okay. I continue and try to relate the concept to architectural design instead. Okay. Uh, because that was actually one of the uh, advice that you gave me, Alessandro, that uh, we have to relate accessibility to architectural design, how accessibility can be perceived and, and understood through drawings. Yeah, thank you. And, I will try to emphasize that, although I would say that some of the bullets on this 10 point, point list is not fully uh, understandable through drawings. Uh, now we have one question, to which extent? Uh, there is a question, uh, Jonas, from uh, uh, a student, Konstantin Schneiders. 
Uh, the question is, uh, to which extent are such rules usually enforced only in public buildings? Do old buildings have to be updated? Well, an easy answer is that the uh, European uh, uh, standard on accessibility will be applicable to official buildings, to public buildings. Uh, and depending on the, uh, on the national context, uh, you will also find that uh, uh, accessibility ac aspects are considered when applying for a building permit. That that is actually the task for the um, official uh, at the municipal municipal level. I I presume it will be mostly who will actually uh, scrutinize your drawings and um, give an okay or. Uh, not an okay sign for, for your design. So originally it was uh, applicable to public architecture, but it has come to be applied to all most type of, of uh, architecture, residential architecture, also architecture for workspace and, and di different uh, work environment. And uh, also the, the updating of the old buildings uh... Uh, is a very relevant question. Italy is full of uh, old public buildings that uh, were updated to, to, to be accessible. So they have to be uh, transformed or uh, modified to, to become accessible, of course, to answer the new requirements of accessibility. Yes, and that was a very good point that you made, Alessandra, because if you compare the European countries to the US, you would see that European countries uh, emphasize the historical and aesthetical uh, inheritance uh, to a larger extent than in the United States. Because in the United States, the, the term universal design implies a, a, an obedience that is, you, you are not allowed to, to have any uh, any levels of poor accessibility in the US, while in, in, your, in the European countries, accessibility are more or less applied to the level of uh, um, the technical level that the building can allow for. So this means that a, a Renaissance palace in, in, it's in Italy cannot completely be uh, uh, applied, uh, could not be completely converted into accessibility it, it has to be done with some sort of delicacy and, and uh, consideration for the architecture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. Uh, on this slide, you can see that uh, two bullets are not highlighted in bold um, uh, characters. And that's the reason for that human abilities and design considerations that's very hard to find in, in the architectural design. And also ambient factors is also not so easy to find in um, architectural design uh, drawings. But uh, on the other hand, the, the bullets 3 to 10 uh, will give you some uh, uh, indication by looking at the drawings. Um, it's maybe not divine concepts, although that I have used the creation of Adam by Michelangelo as a backdrop to this, uh, uh, these 10 bullets. So let's entering into the bullet number one, human abilities and design considerations. Uh, this is actually a stair uh, on a square in Canada that is often promoted as a type of uh, universal design a stair that is made accessible for people by introducing uh, ramps uh, across, across the stairs. Uh, however, I would say that most people with disabilities and using a wheelchair do not consider this design as accessible. Uh, and you can only think of yourself, or I can think of myself as being an academic working mostly sitting at a table in front of my computer. I have a poor level of arm, of, of, of arm strength because being able to going up 
uh, with a wheelchair for these uh, ramps, um, it's quite a heavy task. And the few people with disabilities have the necessary arm force to uh, go up or down for these um, ramps. And if you if you say then that well you can use a mechanical device or or a motorized wheelchair, there is the same problem because those uh, vehicles are quite easily tipped uh, due to uh, there are no clear edges on of the ramps, so there is a risk for tipping the wheelchair, and uh, ultimately this design lacks. Uh, necessary detailing for being actually universal designed. And this is the perhaps uh, most clear example that when you think of a wheelchair, you would you will have to think about the person using the wheelchair. It's only athletes um, who will have the necessary arm strength to uh, be able to go up for this type of a ramp. Uh, now, Andre wrote the question. It, it was about people in Canada. I didn't quite catch it. It was a comment on people in Canada. I, maybe they have more arm, arm power than other nationalities or Yeah, are famous for being nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But yes. Of course. Yes. Of course. It's all. But that's also part of the policy. That uh, it's not that you. If you are talking about universal design, that means that the person with disability should be able to independently use the design. So it's not a fair design if you have to require help to to use the design. So, uh, so of course, this attitude of helping people that could uh, uh, affect the design. But the from people with disabilities, uh, from their point of view, they like to stress that they want to do things independently from being helped uh, up the ramp. So. Appropriate design in my context also mean that it should be design that is possible to use independently as a people with uh, a disability. Uh, so now I've criticized one uh, uh, design and let's continue to uh, another design. Uh, I can just say that a feasible gradient for an individual use uh, for a comfortable individual use for people using a wheelchair is a gradient between 1 to 12 and 1 to 20. Then you will have uh, slopes that are easy, that are possible to um, overcome with a normal arm strength and with the uh, normal um, uh, vehicles uh, Yes, that are uh, assistive equipment for people with disabilities. Uh, this is actually a design from Sweden. Uh, it's the Stockholm City Hall. And normally at this time, you would have had the televised, uh, uh, record, uh, televised programs with the Nobel Prize winners that are dancing in this hall. It's the Golden Hall in the, in the Stockholm City Hall. And it's situated one, uh, uh, one floor up. And as you can see, it's a very grand uh, design. It, it's golden plates on the walls. And it's uh, also applicable to the other aspects of appropriate architectural design that the acoustic has a adequate level for people with the hearing problems to hear and, and uh, being able to talk to each other. It also applies to that the indoor climate is uh, is um, pleasant, and that you can reduce the strong scents or odors. And it's also that it is supposed to be easy to use, and it's this is also well lit 
of course, you have a high level of reflection from the golden plates on the wall. However, there is a small problem with the, this building. Uh, as I said before, it's situated one floor up from the ground floor. So on this uh, section, I think you call it, or um, this section through the building, you can see that the ground floor is here to the right. Uh, so you will enter the building from this side, and then you are supposed to uh, go one floor up. And Ragnar Östberg, he designed this building in the early uh, 20th century. Uh, the building was inaugurated in 1923, and he had a very processional uh, type of uh, entering the building in his mind. So he has uh, used the classical formula for defining stairs in uh, his design. So it, you're supposed to enter this golden hall through this uh, stairway. And this stairway is actually constructed by use of a classical uh, formula for designing appropriate stairs. But I think it was once defined in Florence uh, in order to demonstrate the richness and, and the power of the, uh, the Medici family in Florence. Because uh, going up or down the stairs is not only to be visible, it's also to expose your uh, high quality garments uh, and uh, uh, golden threads in, in your shirt or something like that. But actually here you have the first item of an architectural design that the uh, vertical rise of a step, if you take it by two plus the width of the step, of the step uh, then you will arrive at a sum between 600 and 630 mill millimeters. And this is actually a formula that is still used in most countries when it comes to designing appropriate stairs. However, this does not help the matter in, in the Stockholm City Hall. It has been uh, subject to many ideas of how, of how to overcome this height in different height in levels by use of elevators, because Ragnar Östberg, he did not fully include uh, the access to the Golden Hall through elevators. And there is still an ongoing discussion of of how to do this and how to achieve it. And as you can see from this floor plan, you are entering through this, uh, uh, there's a vault in this uh, building and you enter then the outer courtyard. Then you have four step to, steps to overcome before coming to the uh, the first floor level, and this floor level is the same as in the blue hall, and from the blue hall you ha will have to take the stairs to, to come up to the golden hall. And as you can see from the plan, the access to an elevator is quite rare. And this problem is still not solved, but one idea was to use one of the outcomes of the modern technology. Uh, so, I will hope that this will work, but this is actually one of uh, a Danish product that is used to overcome uh, differences in height in, in uh, existing buildings. So I will try to play it for you. And as you can see, the idea is to convert a normal stair into a lifting platform. So when you come to this uh, stair, you, you push a button and then the stair will convert to becoming a, a lift board. And through uh, this lift board, you will come to the appropriate level that you need. Uh, and the key criteria here is that the stairway must be broad enough. So we continue. 
uh, analyzing another type of uh, Swedish architecture from the 20th century. And then we are looking at a church designed by Sigurd Leverens uh, in his late ages. I think he was about uh, almost closing into being 90 when he got this commission for designing a new church in Klippan in southern Sweden. And uh, his architectural, uh, all of his uh, architecture defines a way from a very classical architecture into becoming an architect which who is focusing on expressiveness and, and emotional experience in a church that this is. But if you look from the outside, um, Sigurd Leverens was very preoccupied to keep the same, to keep the typo, typograph, typographical layout of the site. And in order to do so, he, was, he used the pathways to the church uh, that they, are, they were to be accessible through a firm and drained surface. And having such a surface, then it's possible for most uh, wheelchairs and other assistive equipment to access the building. And in combination with small ramps and the use of local materials, he has created different ways of entering the building. But all these entrances are connected to the to to the 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 profile of the site, so he he can he uh, reused the, the the natural slopes of the site even inside the church, and uh, outside the church you have this uh, mirroring pond that is supposed to either be water filled or to be totally drained depending on the season. Uh, and here you can see a, a, a plan of the site that is that the church is located at the end of a triangular park, and you have these pathways that are either in asphalt or paved with the stones, uh, stones which are quite even, so you get a firm and drained surface. And then you have the, the service building around the church like this. And then you have the church building here. And this is not a building. This is only designed as the mirror point, pond. And you can also conclude that um, uh, Leberenz used crayons when, when uh, drawing his uh, drawings. And most of his drawings are quite elaborate on, on paper or uh, transparent paper. So the quality of the drawings will not be the best when I show them to you like this. Uh, and here you can see a floor plan of the, uh, uh, of the church. And you enter the church from, from this side, from the, from the bottom of the, uh, of the floor plan. And then you have the altar here at the top of the, the floor plan. And you can actually also see here in the corner an early example of uh, an accessible toilet, uh, which is actually something that has developed into in a separate uh, uh, line over the years. About in, in 1966, it was about 1.7 by 1.7 meters. But today, the size is, is quite larger. It's 2.2 by 2.2 in order to be uh, classified as an accessible toilet in Sweden. And I think that's the same size for most Nordic countries. Uh, but returning to the search, you can also see that this uh, preoccupation with the slope, the natural slope of the site makes the, uh, the entrance uh, being positioned somewhat higher than the altar. So you go downwards to, to, enter, to, to come close to the altar. And you're actually seated in a slightly inclined position as well. 
And if you study the drawings, you can see that the gradient is not one by not one by twelve. It's a it's a it's a higher gradient, so it's more closer to one to twenty. So uh, Sigurd Leverens was quite aware of how to use natural slopes in order to cre to use the, this slope as a way of emphasizing the emotional and uh, the emotional experience of this quite dark uh, church wall. You can see that it's it's very much brick and the windows are quite small and you have these vaults above your head. So this was a focus on gradients uh, that you need quite gentle gradients to classify uh, the architectural design as uh, accessible. Uh, and we have another example of a building, and this building is quite recent because another point bullet in the list of accessible aspects is access points, how to access the building. And uh, this building is uh, situated close to the cathedral in the city of Lund. And the cathedral is actually <clears throat> founded <clears throat> by a, a Danish <clears throat> archbishop in the 12th century, in 1176. Um, and uh, this site was part of a European competition for young architects below 40, the age of 40. And it was won by a Spanish architect, by Carmen Izquierdo, who got the commission to design uh, some type of a visiting center to the cathedral. And uh, in this case, according to the Swedish uh, building legislation, when it comes to accessibility and usability, you have to have access points uh, and access points within 25 meters from the entrance to the building. So you can find one access point from the street going in front of the cathedral and one access point from the back of the court of the build, the, 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 the plot uh, from which taxis can enter and let you off just in front of the the entrance to the uh, visit center. And here you can see the different uh, uh, entrances to the building. Uh, to the left, you have this uh, access point uh, where you can uh, enter a small square between the cathedral and the visit center uh, through taxi. And uh, on the other side, to the right, you have the access point from the street. And if we have a further analysis of these access points, you can see that uh, one of the access points can be labeled as level free access. Uh, that is access to the building without any, uh, point, any, any levels at all. And that is actually the case in Denmark, that Denmark is actually emphasizing level free access to any type of public building or uh, public means of transportation, that it should be level free. This has caused some flooding in the Danish subway system during the early 2000, during the millennium, because level free access also means that you have to solve the problem of uh, sudden flooding due to heavy rains. But that's something that the Danish, the Danes has have developed uh, since the first incident. Uh, you also have the gradient question that here you have a ramp, uh, and you enter the ramp from this point, and here you will need a turning space of at least 150 by 150 uh, uh, when it comes to the Swedish requirements. You also will need another space for turning your wheelchair up here 150 by 150 in order to make a u-turn to come to, to enter the 
zero level and then being able to go inside the visit center. Uh, so this was the Domkyrka Forum in Lund as an, a way of explaining gradients and gentle slopes as a way of uh, uh, allowing equal access for people with disabilities. And when I say one to 12, you, you have to consider that this is an old measurements used by uh, craftsmen at a building site that 12 meters is actually the horizontal uh, measurement in order to to achieve uh, uh, to arrive at a height of one meter so you always have to have this triangle in your head when you talk about one to twelve and one to twenty and furthermore in the swedish case uh, the length of the ramp is restricted to being not longer than five meters so uh, at every five meters, you have to introduce a space for resting with a space which then would be 150 by 150. And here you can see some of uh, some pictures from or some photographs from the visit center. Uh, the ramp uh, to the left uh, and in here you have a small photograph of the square between the cathedral and the visit center. And this is uh, an interesting window from the inside because there is a visual connection between the cathedral and uh, a session hall inside the building. And here you can see the open square, uh, the open space uh, uh, that constitutes the cafeteria area in the building. Another example of uh, architecture made by Sigurd Leverance is the Malmö Opera. And Sigurd Leverance, he was actually a, a, an architect that participated in quite many architectural competitions. So after be participating in the competition for the Stockholm Forest Cemetery, he participated in a competition for another cemetery here in Malmö called the Östra Kyrkogården. Uh, and through that uh, winning in that competition in Malmö, he also started to get commissions from the city council. And one of these uh, uh, commissions was to design a new building for a theater, uh, build, a theater here in Malmö. Uh, it wasn't called an opera then, it was only called theatre, but it, it has uh, achieved the name of Mal the Malmö Opera ever since. And uh, he actually got the commission in 1926. So he started off in a classical architecture, but it, he had to change the architectural design because of the Stockholm Exposition in 1930 when the functionalistic architecture uh, entered the Swedish uh, agenda for appropriate architecture. So he had to convert his classical ideas to a functionalistic idea of appropriate architecture. And of course, this is something that you have to consider when designing a theater that you have a sufficient space for entering and exiting the, the, the um, space for the audience, because otherwise you will have uh, uh, combustion by the doorways that many people are trying to get out. Perhaps one person is trying to get inside and that will create a turmoil outside the doors. And then this, uh, the, the width of the balconies are quite essential. Uh, to allow an easy access in and out from the the audience space. Uh, he was also thinking quite a lot of how to uh, going up these um, uh, stairs from the ground floor to the top floor of the building. Uh, 
but you can see that uh, it's quite a low, uh, quite a spacious space. Uh, the the measurements are quite generous, and uh, the building was inaugurated in 1944. And uh, it's possible to use a normal, at least three types of wheelchairs in this space. That you can either use a normal indoor wheelchair with a turning space of uh, a diameter with one of 130 or an outdoor wheelchair with a diameter of 150 or a specially equipped wheelchair uh, with a turning uh, space of with a diameter of two meters uh, but you can see that all these measurements have been incorporated into what is then to be considered as a sufficient space for a good uh, foyer in front of uh, the audience space in a theater. And here you can see some of the detailed measurements that you have to consider when designing a theater. Uh, and this is only focusing on a wheelchair. You have the turning space for a wheelchair. And the turning space for a wheelchair, it's often depicted as a circular movement but it's actually a going back and forth with a wheelchair. So you will have different positions of the wheelchair before being able to having accomplished a, a complete 360 degree turn. So this, the circle is only approximation of different uh, movements with a wheelchair. And in this, uh, in, in Sweden, this, uh, this di the diameter is considered to be 150 but you can see that it's actually a bit larger. And uh, currently we are aware that about, that this measurement can be used for about 80% of the wheelchairs existing on the market, but at least 20% of the wheelchairs will have, prob will have problems in uh, buildings that have this, ha have, estimated the turning space to 150 only. And this is also an interesting uh, collection of measurements which describes a corridor that the corridor width in the Nordic country context should actually be 130, but in this case, the, the image says 900 centimeters. And I think that's the measurements that you use in uh, southern Europe that you consider a corridor of one uh, of, of 90 centimeters sufficient but you still have this problem of making a, a 90 degree turn and making this 90 degree turn also supposes several small movements with the wheelchairs in order to arrive at the turn and you also have to consider the the this, the measurement for for two people meeting in a corridor uh, that the preferred width of a corridor is 150. Uh, if you have 150, then two wheelchairs can cross each other uh, at a comfortable distance, and also 150 allows for a comfortable meeting between a wheelchair and and a walking person. And all of these measurements have to be have to be combined into one uh, big combination of measurements when you design public buildings like theaters. Uh, and this is actually a photograph from uh, the inauguration of the space in 1944. And you can see how elegant that this hallway is. And you could perhaps also discern that this architect has not completely left the classical tradition uh, and entered into functionalistic uh, uh, into the functionalistic movement because some of the uh, the installations for lighting are quite classical or uh, quite in a design that are not completely functional. And considering the design of a theater, you also have to consider how to be comfortable seated. And uh, recently, and that this is quite a recent phenomenon, 
in, in most European countries that uh, people using wheelchairs are demanding to be integrated within the rows in a natural way. And this means that you have to be able to remove one of the chairs to allow for space for a wheelchair, because then you can be seated in an equal way as a person only using the, the available seats. So this is also a requirement uh, that you have to think when you, when you, about when you design uh, an audience space that you have to integrate space for wheelchairs within the rows for seating of, of um, the, the audience who are walking. Uh, maybe we shall have a break after the vertical circulation, then we are, I think, about halfway. Uh, because, of course, accessibility is also very much related to vertical circulation. And uh, then you have to consider that elevators was introduced in architecture by the end of the 19th century. So it's a quite a recent phenomenon. And the first elevators were quite small. But over the years, they have uh, developed into quite uh, large uh, installations. And I, I would like to use this example of uh, Le Louvre in, in Paris as a good example of an elevator that is accessible. Because in E.M. Pei's mind, uh, there is a problem when it comes to entering the, Le, the Louvre, because the entrance is situated about seven meters above the entrance floor. And then you have to solve the access point for people with the uh, using wheelchairs. And quite elegantly, EMP has designed this uh, swirling staircase that goes around a cylindrical shaped um, elevator. And it is, it is said that the, uh, the speed of the elevator is the equal to the speed of going upwards or uh, downwards this swirling, swirling staircase. So let's use technology to have one of this experience by use of this YouTube clip. And this is maybe also a, an homage to the French technology that invented this special elevator and a hydraulic elevator for this uh, building project. And this is a clip from the inauguration or, or the pre preparations for the inauguration that everything was working uh, smoothly for the big event when Francois Mitterrand inaugurated the museum. Uh, so this is just to sum up the uh, architectural design that you have the entrance level is above the ground level, and in this case, it's about seven meters. And then the problem is to solve the architectural design problem of entering the building on a higher level than the ground floor. And I, in my mind, I think that EMP solved it uh, splendidly by introducing this hydraulic elevator and this swirling staircase. And elevators uh, are a building uh, element that are quite substantial, quite important for the modern design of, of uh, architecture. And in, in Europe, most of the, the minimum car size is limited to a size of 1.1 1 .1 meter by 1.4 meters. That's the smallest car size for a wheelchair. And uh, this also uh, means that the, the elevator car has to be designed in a special way, because then you're entering the elevator uh, straightforward, but you have to go out of the elevator by back going backwards. And that's the reason for why the 
elevator has to be equipped with a mirror so that the person in a wheelchair could see uh, backwards by use of the mirror. And another uh, design requirement is that an elevator should be equipped with a seating, a, a small foldable seat, because people with uh, poor balance uh, better be seated uh, rather than standing up going uh, you, when using the elevator. There should also be grab rails uh, around the elevator car, uh, at least on two sides. And the maneuvering panel for the elevator should be placed in the middle of the car. So it's easily accessible from a person using a wheelchair. The, the person in a wheelchair can easily stretch out to push the buttons. And another design feature that is regulated in standard is that the ground floor level should be highlighted through a green uh, uh, green uh, projecting uh, circle around the button so that you know that when pushing this button, button you will come to the ground floor. Uh, and th these uh, requirements are not so if you only look at on the floor plan, you cannot. Uh, uh, it, it's not sufficient for designing appropriate uh, elevators for people with disabilities. You also have to consider the elevation uh, and the side of the car. And also, when it comes to vertical cir circulation, you have to consider the staircase uh, because going backwards out from an elevator, you will perhaps encounter the risk of uh, going backwards too much. And then there is a risk for tipping down a staircase or falling down a staircase. So there is a safety distance between the elevator and the, sta and, and the, the stair, which is at least 2.1 meter in, uh, according to Swedish regulation. Uh, and I think that's about the same in, in most European countries, that you need this safety distance of 2.1 meter in order to n avoid uh, incidents and uh, accidents falling down a stair. And also, once again, using a stair, you also have to have this uh, spa necessary space for turning your wheelchair. In this case, doing a 90 degree turn and then doing another uh, another 90 degree turn. And in this case, doing first a 90 degree turn and then yet another 90 degree turn. Uh, so this circular, uh, this circle of with a diameter of 150 uh, is quite necessary when you start to think about architectural, appropriate architectural design for people with disabilities. So I think that we have a short break here uh, for 15 minutes. Uh, yes, yes, perfect, Jonas. So uh, uh, how much, uh, 15 minutes? Uh, I don't know whether whether it's the same for you, but 15 minutes, that's quite sufficient for, for us, I think. Okay, okay, great. So I, okay. I... So we have three bullets to go. But uh, I think that we are perhaps leaving the direct uh, uh, effects of architectural design, although architects tend to be very uh, focused on, on details like door handles and handrails and also switches. And when it comes to uh, thinking of uh, accessibility and usability for people with disabilities, you have to think about the functionality of your hand. Uh, some of these, I, I would say that the switch and the door handle are not examples of, accept, of accessible architectural designs because they require a quite uh, fully functional hand. So if you have some difficulties in using your hand, it could be difficult to switch on or off the light since the buttons are very small. 
uh, and the door handle is very edged. So it could be difficult to fit it in it into your hand and maybe you will also feel uh, some level of pain because the, the, the angles are cutting into your hand. Although, but I would say that the handrail is quite nicely adjusted to to the hand and the use. Uh, actually, it's it's also uh, equipped with lead, leather, so it's quite pleasant to to feel and touch. Uh, you also have the question about how to maneuver elevators. And in this case, elevators that are called uh, low speed elevators, which is a type of elevators that has evolved quite recently. Uh, and these elevators, normally they don't require uh, a special uh, distance at the bottom of the shaft, nor they do they require a top of the shaft. Uh, so they are quite easy to fit into existing buildings and you can have prefabricated shaft walls that you're uh, assembling around the elevator. But the small problem is that if you are to use this elevator, you have to maneuver this red button during the full journey. So if you want to go from one level to another level, your hand has to be uh, uh, positioned on the red button and actually maneuvering the elevator to the next floor. And that is uh, part of the standardization rules for this type of elevators. Uh, otherwise, you could say that it, perhaps this is not the ultimate architectural design or the ultimate ergonomic design for, for a uh, panel in an elevator, but it's a consequence of technical requirements. And when it comes to stairs, we have already discussed the classical formula for designing an appropriate stair. Uh, however, functionalistic architecture has introduced, at least in the Swedish context, that the maximum rise in a, of a stair, of a step in a, in a stair, could be as high as 18.5 centimeters, uh, which, which is quite high, I think. It, you really have to pay attention to lifting your foot uh, to the correct level in order to be able to use this type of stair. On the other hand, the diameter of a handrail uh, reduce, uh, set to 45 millimeters, I think that's, that's the normal average uh, size that fits most uh, hands. Uh, and also from a perspective perspective of, people, of persons having visual problems, uh, the design of uh, the staircase could also be a question about good or bad architectural designs. Because uh, normally people with uh, uh, visual pro uh, problems do not appreciate that the rise of each step are transparent because the light penetrating the stair and, and lighting up each step will create a visual problem to discerning the, the start and the end of each step. Uh, it's not a requirement in the Swedish context that you, you mustn't design stairways with open rises. However, that is actually a requirement of this new European standard that in public buildings, the rises have to be closed so that people with visual uh, problems can use them easily. Uh, and continuing on this topic, this is actually very much focused on the user and the interaction between the user and the architectural design. It's probably features that are not uh, discernible through floor plans, it's mostly uh, conceivable by use of elevations and sections through architecture. And this is actually all related to the fact that people with disabilities and also using a wheelchair, they have a limited reach. They cannot reach out from their body uh, so long, so much. 
so in average, the, their reach is about 30 centimeters. And it's possible for them to rise their hand to a height of 1.10 meters above the floor, but preferably not more than 80 centimeters. And uh, they can stretch forward as low as 40 centimeters above the floor. Uh, and also you have to, in this case, you can see this uh, girl using the ATM machine that there are quite poor uh, clearance space for the knees. Uh, in order to improve the reach, uh, if you introduce a clearance space for the knee, then you will get a, a better functionality of the ATA machine. Uh, and below you can see that actually very poor uh, condition for this ATA machine as well. Although it's quite the normal situation in the Swedish context that the ATA machine is situated at a uh, walkway. Uh, so that half the walkway will be blocked by the person using the ATA machine uh, since there are since there is no uh, uh, clearance for uh, knees. And you can continue on this topic ergonomic versus architecture uh, because the, if you if you look at wheelchairs, the normal thing is that you you have an indoor wheelchair at home. And this normal indoor wheelchair has a turning space that could be equal to a, a circular space with a diameter of 130 meters. Uh, it's quite a, a comfortable indoor chair, but it's not suitable to use outdoor other than for very temporary usages. So, for instance, in a Nordic climate, uh, a longer use outside in snow, for instance, will be devastating for this type of wheelchair. So going outside, you will preferably use another type of wheelchair with a larger turning space. And this turning space will have a diameter of approximately 1.50 meters. And then finally, if you have special needs so that you have a quick have to equip your wheelchair with uh, special adjustments uh, for an arm or for a neck rest, then you will end up with a larger turning space, uh, about two meters diameter of, for this turning space. And of course, this also raises the question about the free passage with for door or doorways that in the Swedish case, and I think that's the General distance for most Nordic countries is about 800 and 850 millimeters. That the free space between the the framework frame for the door and the uh, door the side of the door leave should be at minimum 850 millimeters. And once again, if you look at the clearance space for knee, you will see that. A, a, a height of uh, at least 670 cent millimeters will create a, su a sufficient height for knee clearance under a, a table or a, a bench, for instance. And these are all uh, measurements that you have to uh, actually take from your own body and transfer it to the architectural design. So if you're unsure about things when it comes to accessible architecture, you have to use your own, what we call, I think it's called meter, but you have to use this meter to measure your own measurements and then consider whether you're a normal, a normal height person or whether you're a a smaller or larger person in comparison to what could be considered to be normal. And what is a recent phenomenon and that will also create uh, a large, a large, a big problem for, for future accessibility projects with existing buildings is the, is the concept of fire safety for all. 
and uh, returning to the very uh, uh, first images when we discussed the Robson uh, stair in, in Vancouver, uh, fire safety for ore is based on the independence principle that in, in case of an emergency, I as a person with a disability, I want to be sure that I independently can, can um, use the evacuation route to a fire exit uh, independently so that I can be assured of getting out of the building without the help of other people. Uh, and this is not always the case uh, when it comes to uh, fire exits and evacuating uh, buildings. In most cases, uh, in most countries, uh, suppose that the fire safety should be based on on the assistance of other people evacuating the building. But in many cases, if you look back on the fire uh, catastrophes, you could see that people with a disability are the, mo are the people that are most um, viable to be trapped in the evacuation situation and not being able to get outside of the building. Um, and this is also a big discussion ongoing here in Sweden about this independent way of evacuating building for a person with a wheelchair or person with disabilities. Um, and we don't have the exact answer to that problem because you have one, you have the wheelchair that is assisted equipment. Then you have another problem if you have visual problems and then you will have another problem when it comes to um, uh, hearing problems in case of emergency. Uh, so, but it is a big issue and a big discussion uh, here in Sweden. And I think uh, as well as in most European countries due to this new standard on minimum requirements on accessibility in the European Union. Um, as a consequence of this, uh, we don't have quite many of the uh, evacuation lifts or elevators here in Sweden. We still have just a handful of them. Maybe you have more elevators for evacuation and emergency in Italy. Uh, but at least it's a delicate matter for uh, the national heritage in Sweden, how to evacuate the old buildings when you have uh, a long historical tradition. And uh, this is one of the uh, examples of an emergency elevator here in Sweden that could be found in the castle of Kalmar or Kalmar Slot at the city of Kalmar in southern Sweden as well. It's a Renaissance castle and this type of Renaissance architecture uh, used the architectural design to emphasize the difference between or, or emphasize the social status between the, the, the people and the, the sovereign. And um, so there are quite high, the rise of the steps are, are doubles, the double size of normal steps in, in, in any type of architecture. And in this case, there was this need for evacuating uh, a big uh, hall uh, at the second floor of the building. Uh, however, being a castle that had been realized in, in several different periods, um, it, all the, the rooms were not interconnected. So you had to find a spot where you could find uh, access points to different levels in the building. Uh, and the final outcome and the final con design consideration in this case was to work with an architectural design that um, created differences between the old uh, design uh, with the uh, heavy walls and plastered walls. Uh, so they introduced this uh, elevator in a glazed with glazed shaft. Uh, so here you can see a floor plan of this. Uh, castle. Uh, it was a castle. It is a castle that was realized uh, 
from early on and the final uh, or the existing architecture is mostly from the 16th century. Uh, and here you can see that the only way to to find a common access point was to introduce this elevator in close to a major tower in the building and then cutting through uh, several walls in the building. But in this way here it was considered that the it was considered that, that uh, this um, uh, what do you say? This mm, modern uh, uh, in installation in the very old architecture was to be considered as necessary, and that it was not that, and that the emergency reasons were heavier than the uh, national heritage uh, reasoning. Uh, but we are actually. Uh, entering the era of other buildings with evacuation elevators. And I think that you all remember the big fire in London some years ago in a residential tower in which uh, many people were trapped uh, due to the fact that the fire was not only inside the building, but was also part of a, build, uh, of a fire that uh, was ongoing in the facade which actually made it impossible to evacuate the building. Uh, so evacuation lifts are, are, is something that is to be evolved. And perhaps we are entering into the most trivial matter that is a matter that we all need, a sanitary accommodation. And uh, as I said before, the, the minimum requirement for uh, an accommodation, a sanitary accommodation of appropriate size in Sweden is to be considered to be 2.2 2 .2 by 2.2 .2 meters a square. Then you have sufficient space for a larger wheelchair. You have also sufficient space for an assistant if that's the need. And you have also extra space uh, uh, close to the toilet seat and close to the um, uh, water basin, I think it's called. Uh, and one a new item that has been introduced in, lately in the Swedish building code is that there should also be contrasting colors because contrasting colors will help people with visual impairments to discern where the uh, white uh, um, water closet is, is uh, situated uh, in the room. And actually, you can see that although this is a very early example of an accessible toilet in, in St. Petri uh, Kyrkan in Klippan in southern Sweden, you can see that Sigurd Leverens was working with different materials and even the flooring had a different color so that it's quite, the toilet seat is quite discernible, although you don't have this necessary turning space uh, on either side of the toilet seat. And the reason for this development is that actually that the development of new assistive equipment will allow for people with quite severe disabilities uh, to be able to move around in society more freely than before. Because it's today it's, it's possible to have an adjusted wheelchair to your personal needs. And of course, uh, you, you also will have uh, new measurements for public toilets. Uh, perhaps uh, when the public toilets were introduced in the uh, European cities, uh, they were mostly intended for men and they were mostly uh, circular with a very small uh, diameter. But public toilets, uh, they are actually to be considered as a, a rather uh, important design feature that is entering into the townscape. And here you can see some types of, of public toilets, toilets here in Malmö, uh, either picking up a, a functionalistic tone of architecture, perhaps with a maritime theme, you can find this type of uh, 
public toilets uh, in the former dockyards. Uh, you can also find this more slick design of a toilet in one of the parks. Or you can find this prototype of a new public toilet that, that, are, that is used in most Swedish uh, cities around the country. Uh, it's, so, it, it's the same manufacturer of uh, both of these types. Uh, and you can even find a public toilet just outside the Royal Castle in Stockholm, but with this uh, circular design. And you can see that the measurements of a public toilet is actually about the same size as a larger car by now. Uh, so it's, it's quite a, a, an intrusive uh, architectural element in, in a sensitive uh, uh, town environment. And then entering into the final aspect of um, architectural design, uh, you have uh, different uh, details that will help you navigate and orient and help you wayfind in a built environment. So according to the, to the Swedish building code, as well as in most Nordic countries, you will have this requirement that glazed walls have to have uh, contrast markings so that a person with a visual uh, problem will be able to find out uh, the openings and the closed space uh, to avoid crashing into a glazed wall. Uh, so here you can see two types of uh, contrast markings on glazed walls uh, in uh, public environments in, in Sweden. Uh, often this broad ribbon of of the uh, of, uh, opaque glass uh, with the uh, transparent uh, par uh, par uh, parts of uh, glass. Uh, and in the middle, you have another feature that actually is quite recent. It was developed originally in Japan during the 1970s. And that is a tactile marking uh, that you put on the floor in order to help people with uh, visual problems to find their way from one point to another point. And this use of, uh, of, of uh, this combination of uh, um, either upstanding circular points or uh, rectangular upstanding or uh, inverted into the um, paved uh will help the person with visual impairment to understand either to stop and uh, be aware of a possible uh, danger or using this uh, rectangular uh, shape then you will get the message go ahead you will find the direction at the next uh, uh, stopping uh, decision point and the decision point would then be this upstanding circular cones uh, and this combination of uh, quite easy features put in the floor uh, is also something that is introduced in most countries. Uh, and one perhaps might say that in the European countries, we have uh, made these, uh, these tactile markings more pleasant to the eye for, for the group of people without visual uh, problems. Because in the Japanese um, original idea, uh, they are colored in a bright yellow, co yellow color. Uh, and obviously, this yellow color has not been uh, accepted by uh, the Western countries. So in, in Western countries, we have this, this um, differences in, in, uh, in uh, tactility, but not the color. And then finally, you also have contrast markings on stairs. And here you can find differences between any European country uh, of how to execute contrast markings in stairs. Uh, in Sweden, we are quite happy with the contrast marking at, on the very first step and on the very last step. But I think in Italy, you need 
a contrast marking on each step, which is not considered to be accessible an accessible stair in Sweden because we have different views on what is accessible when it comes to contrast marking on stairs. Uh, but it, it's a, a whole other discussion, so I won't enter into detail. You also have this uh, question about signage and, and uh, tactile signs, so that these signage are uh, put in relief, so that you can feel with your finger or through touch, you can get the same message, since it's also indicated in in Bry uh, at the bottom of the uh, uh, letters. And perhaps this is also something that is uh, this need for signage is perhaps something that is also uh, something that is entering into the modern architecture for the moment. Uh, because here in the Malmö, we have a new modern museum uh, that is integrated in an old power plant from the early 20th century. And um, it's a uh, it's it's a slick building in 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 a steel material with uh, that is transparent, and you can see that the name of the museum, the modern museum, is actually indicated in the design of this orange cubicle that has been introduced as a way of announcing that this building has a new usage at a museum. Uh, and also this new type of, of informing about what's happening inside the building by just putting the text plainly on, on a doorway. Uh, it's also a new way of, of uh, signing what is going on in a building. So signage is another way of adding information of how to use and interact with the building. Um, arriving at the conclusion, uh, as you can see, and this goes for most European countries, is that architects have been quite involved in the development of accessibility requirements. And the most uh, uh, clear example of that is Ronald L. Mays, the American architect. Uh, however, European architects have not um, uh, profiled themselves as accessible architects. Uh, and I think that's due to the fact that most architects perceive accessibility and usability as an integral part of the Vitruvian virtues of architecture. That is, good architecture should be sustainable. It should have some a level of beauty, and it should also reflect um, some level of uh, connection with the user of the architectural space, so that it should be it, ha it should have some level of commodity. Commodity. Uh, so then you have this uh, the three virtues of firmistas, venustas, and utilitas as Vitruvius coined for more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, and if you look back at some Swedish architects that I have mentioned, you can say that neither of these architects have chosen to label themselves as accessible architects. Uh, accessibility has been mostly treated as something that is part of, a, of an appropriate architectural design. And whether they, he was a classical architect or functionalist architect, Gunnar Asplund designed his buildings uh, with a keen eye to arriving at a, a generous space so it could allow for different uses and usages. And you can also find it in the architecture of Sigurd Leverens. This is actually one the, the illustration to the competition entry that Leverens made together with Gunnar Asplund in 1916. Uh, and you can see that Sigurd Leverens was a quite sharp uh, 
uh, sketch artist. Uh, this hand sketch is quite similar to a constructed perspective. And he had a very uh, developed eye for, for sensing the shape and proportion. But still, it's a very, still, it's an accessibility is more or less built in into his architectural designs. Uh, and if you go to more recent and contemporary architects, although Rolf Askin had an English training, he worked in Sweden for most of his uh, uh, time as practicing architect since he came to Sweden during the 19, uh, no, during the Second World War. So he was mostly practicing architect here in Sweden, but even in his designs, uh, accessibility and usability are integral, integral uh, qualities of, of the appropriate design. And uh, you can also find the same integration of accessibility and usability of another very, I think it's a, mostly an architect that is known by Swedish architects. Carl Nyrén, uh, who, who combined a traditional wooden building uh, tradition in, in Sweden with more modernistic uh, endeavors and uh, um, trans, uh, transformation of the wooden architecture into uh, concrete architecture. So this is actually a competition entry for the Stockholm University that is actually realized quite exactly to this. Uh, the, the final outcome is very similar to the perspective or the view that was constructed. And you can also find it perhaps in the most known Swedish architect for the moment, Jatvin Gård, that his designs are also not uh, explicitly accessible since accessibility and usability uh, are integral parts of his design thinking. Uh, and he, he's very much uh, attentive to details in, in the architectural design so that he will arrive at a special architectural effect, uh, like this circular building, uh, which is part of uh, 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 the Karolinska Hospital here in Stockholm. So I have come to the end of this lecture on, access, uh, on accessible architecture. Uh, and if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them now. And I hope that we could have a short discussion about your views on accessibility, usability, and appropriate architectural design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas. It was very interesting and very large, also including uh, information about uh, modernist and uh, contemporary uh, Swedish architects. That is also interesting for us. And uh, I, of course, I would like the students uh, put some questions uh, to to Professor Anderson. Uh, also, starting from their experience of uh, of designers, or also in general. Uh, I can see whether my uh, one of my students is with me. Us still is Joanna with us. Maybe she can start off with a question. Uh, she is here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and we normally collaborate doing these uh, digital teaching because I often forget recording and Joanna has <laughs> assumed the role of uh, reminding me, push the record button. <laughs> and I hope that she perhaps has a question about accessibility. Uh, either way, you could say about this. Uh, now we can see there was a question about. Yes. Could you please comment? Do you? Do not the talk titling help the people. Yes, by uh, Andre Parshin, yes. Yeah. Um, no, I would say no, because uh, the tactile 
tiling or, or tactile marking, it's actually abbreviated TWSI, uh, Tactile Walking Surface Indicator, that's the exact term for it. They are normally placed in the middle of uh, uh, a pathway. And, uh, and actually, we have not had any incidents that they are confusing or cause problems for people using wheelchairs because they are supposed to be, I mean, the, the relief is very short, it's not so deep. So it's not possible for a wheelchair uh, a wheel to get stuck in those. And then do you think us designers should reach, should research such issues as many were doing? Or today, uh, or today we should rely entirely on what scientists Says. No, I think that you should research uh, these issues because, uh, as I tried to explain, uh, this is actually accessibility and usability is something that is constantly shifting. So, what was considered in the early 1960s as adequate design requirements has proven to be not so adequate today. And this suggests that uh, it's more a question about how the assistive equipment uh, look like, because it is the assistive equipment has actually an influence of of, uh, of the individual measurements that we all have. I mean, the imprint of our bodies will change due to the assistive equipment. So, in my mind you have to pay attention to the development of new assistive uh, technologies uh, and products. Uh, so uh, designers should, questions, uh, should question uh, uh, standardization measures and al always relate them to what is appropriate to the architectural context and also to the, the, the heritage of, of the building, because it's always a balance between, uh, I mean, people with disabilities, they will not gain from uh, erasing the uh, historical tradition of of, uh, of Kalmar slot by introducing a complete modern elevator, because then the f the full value is lost for them. Because they, of course, they want to experience the same. Renaissance look as any other average user without a wheelchair. And then we have third. It seems me wrongly that architects today are simply not taught to research such issues. Um, yes, that's perhaps. Uh, uh, I would I, I agree that today um, accessibility requirements are no longer part of the training to become an architect, not even here in Sweden. Um, it's, it is considered to be something that the students could assume during different stu study projects. Uh, so, of course, there could perhaps be a need for further studies on architecture and ergonomics. Uh, are there elements of accessibility where you would say that they cross a line, ruin the design, or are too forced? Is there even such a thing as going too far? Yes, I do think that there is a problem of going too far because uh, in some cases uh, you have to question whether you can achieve 100% accessibility and usability or if you have to uh, uh, agree on a lower level of accessibility, uh, and especially when it comes to buildings of uh, national interest and, and uh, unique qualities. Um, from our previous experience working with these questions um, at the Swedish uh, governmental offices, uh, we had this problem with the uh, the the church in the royal castle, because this uh, church is 
situated on the first floor. And you have once again this uh, staircase that is designed for processions uh, that is supposed to demonstrate the royal uh, grandeur and, and all the um, details that is combined with royalty that you can see the, the king uh, uh, ascending or descending this stairway. And due to the location in the royal castle, there are very few possibilities to install a new elevator. And uh, if you install an elevator, then you have to remove this old staircase. Uh, and then some of the architectural value would, will be lost. Uh, so it, it's not pr completely solved this problem, but one of the outcomes was that uh, they installed in another space. Uh, you could, you, by use of uh, modern technology, uh, computer technology, if you have a wheelchair, then you can enter this spe special space. And by use of uh, augmented reality, you can experience the church uh, one floor above through this augmented reality. So in this case, AR was considered to be a mean to help accessibility uh, for people with wheelchairs who could not enter the church by themselves. If they should, if they would, they had to be carried up to the church. Uh, but it was the, the spatial experience and that was given to them through uh, AR instead. I think it's very interesting because uh, there are many elements of interest in, in your lecture, Jonas, I think. And uh, one of them is that uh, the, the question about accessibility uh, is part of, of a larger question, I think, that is the question of comfort and uh, focusing on these problems help us in understanding generally the problem of comfort. Uh, for all people uh, with different kind of uh, capacity of movement, uh, of the vision, of, or other other functions. So uh, that is a quite uh, different uh, point of view in reference with the modernist one that was uh, performative, was uh, for standard, because this is a kind of approach that mixed a lot of uh, different uh, aspects. One aspect, of course, are measures, the, the sloping of the ramp, uh, the, 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 the white of the corridor, but there are also colors, uh, textures, textures, mm -hmm. uh, perception, uh, and the, because uh, accessibility, of course, is a matter of fact, but it is also a feeling you know, that, that, that a space can appear accessible or not, can invite people or not, can show the way to, to, to use that in the better way or not. So this is very uh, important and uh, uh, this lecture help us in, in, uh, in considering the, the building under this aspect. Another interesting point that was, was at the beginning of the lecture was about the help. No, because in the, in the, in the, in countries that we can say are less developed or uh, help is very used. No, uh, people uh, with problems of accessibility is helped. Uh, in more developed countries, uh, people has to be put in the condition of be independent. Uh, I understand that for people with the, problem of, uh, of movement, for example, or, or, or vision, to be independent is absolutely substantial. No? The, the, the idea that I can make something when I want, as I want, uh, independently from the help of the others. On the other side, helping people is a beautiful thing. And to, to, to the possibility of being helped is, is a great thing. No? It's a, the human contact, the human solidarity. So in a way, we are we want, we try to help people considering uh, uh, design for all. 
not or universal design, etc. Because this is our way to help people. Uh, but this point for me is very open. No, it can also take to to other interesting things. I thoughts. I think another interesting point is historical buildings. Not like the the castle, the Renaissance castle that you show. Uh, this uh, is uh, uh, relevant because uh, I think that buildings uh, uh, very often, not always, but very often, historical buildings are made of different layers. No? Also, that castle you, you said was mostly built in the, in the uh, maybe 15th or 16th century, but mostly, no? we're, we're probably is built over an older one, and probably there were many interventions uh, in in all centuries that this happens normally in the, in historical buildings so that that is a modernist idea that we cannot touch anymore the buildings so the development of a building maybe starts uh, 1000 years ago and stop in in the 50s because after the 50s or after the 60s the heritage authorities stop the possibility of uh, of the, the co this continuous changing of the building but the continuous changing of the building is on one side the the alteration of its original state but often first there is no original state but there are a sequence of different states and second uh, the possibility of transform a building is the is the life itself of, for a building a building that is transforming into something fixed uh, is uh, as no future. No, is is can just stay there like a museum of itself. So this is a, a general, again, is a general question that uh, is very related to accessibility because uh, all buildings are never accessible for all, but uh, is affect the entire relation that we want to have with all buildings. Uh, another point interesting and is the scale of the design because often uh, sometimes the, the, the scale of the design is absolutely architectural especially when for example we have to connect different levels uh, etc but uh, often the scale of the design is uh, related with the interior or with the objects or with the elements or components that are applied to architecture you know, like the textures or like the colors or like the specific uh, matters that we want to use or the so this is a point that ask us to be uh, sensible sensitive also in reference with the uh, design products and uh, furniture and uh, all the complement that uh, often arrive in the building after the end of the design uh, design concept and, and the, the the architectural project the architectural design so this is another interesting enlargement of the scale of design on one on one side towards the interiors and the and the industrial design on the other side towards the urban design because often this uh, accessibility involved like the the building that you show at the beginning the the public space uh, the 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 the, uh, the walkways uh, the, the the road uh, the circulation out of the building and the connection between the public realm of the outdoor and the, and the inside of the building so i don't know gino baldi if you want to say anything uh, okay. Gino, yes, is the is the, the tutor of uh, of uh, the uh, the course of our course. Yes, no, um, I found interesting uh, the the lesson of today, and I found interesting also because uh, uh, the idea of architecture is maybe in an abstract way uh, a way to create uh, a place for human basically uh, with the measure of human being the human uh, necessity and when we have uh, uh, another kind of necessity another kind of measure uh, the the concept of architecture in a way change a little bit and so i found interesting this uh, 
different uh, way to understand and to research in uh, in the architectural project. And uh, I I think that uh, also the, the the interesting point uh, and maybe the, um, the the research for the contemporary project could be also find a way to integrate the, the system uh, as a, for um, for the accessible architecture. So to don't create uh, um, some elements uh, only that uh, uh, create the accessible architecture, but uh, seems to be a, an, uh, an adding element, but uh, to integrate this element in the general concept of architecture. So creating a new occasion with uh, the, the accessible architecture tools, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Gino. I think that it's important to to be aware of accessibility when designing. I, I, that would be my main point. That it's better to consider it or con consider human er ergonomics when designing rather than entering that sub subject when the building is ready and and uh, realized, because then the the possibilities to to have a good architectural design is nil then every level of adjustment is uh, eradicated because it's already built and it will lead to enormous cost, cost to adjust the building to what is actually needed. Uh, and then I would also like to add that, of course, I think that you also have to take into account that uh, the Nordic countries are more are not so densely built as the southern countries in, in Europe. So that will mean that we will have different um, uh, problems when it comes to accessibility. In, in the Nordic countries, I think that we have a larger level of uh, compensating for uh, accessibility lacks uh, and problems because we have, uh, it's not so densely built. While in Italy, you, you have quite densely built uh, environments with a very special type of uh, uh, problems for accessibility because you have the, the liberty or the, the freedom for design interventions is much more restricted in such a context than in the Nordic countries. So you also have to uh, include the, the, the density of the built environment in order to arrive at a good conclusion when it comes to accessibility. And, and also just expanding this notion of accessibility, you also have to consider topography because I think that Denmark is the, is the flattest Nordic country of them all. Sweden is, is rather flat and Finland as well. But the requirements that we have in Denmark, Sweden, Finland, they are quite difficult applicable in Norway, for instance, because Norway is a country with, with a quite hilly uh, topography. And then, of course, nature will create special problems when it comes to accessibility as well. And then you have to include uh, another layer of, of design thinking. How, to, how do you integrate your building in the surrounding context? And just a final comment, uh, Alessandra, on your um, comment of, about Kalmar Castle. You could also say that one of the reasons for doing this um, intervention in this Renaissance building was that purely commercial, because the museum had to develop and divide, diversify their activities. And uh, this new elevator uh, created all the possibilities to have a more diversified uh, museum, which have attracted a larger number of visitors. Yeah. I think it's a good reason to do that, <laughs> uh, because it is the, also it's very difficult to, to keep these buildings alive, often uh, also economically. Okay, so Jonas uh, Anderson, 
I'm very glad that you we 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 could have uh, we could receive this lecture for, from you. Uh, so thank you very much. I I hope that we will have for sure we will have other occasions of uh, of meeting and the cooperation in the future. And uh, so thank you and see you soon uh, on video or in person. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, th yeah. Thank you. Thank you for okay. having me. Uh, and okay. I will send you a PDF copy of the very latest version of the. Um, oh, thanks. Thanks. So yeah. I I will share that with the students uh, if uh, if you allow no, that's, them. That's okay. 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 Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.